Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Jake, and I'm a product specialist here at Oculus. Welcome to tonight's clinical webcast entitled Every Clinician's Guide to Axial Length Measurement, Becoming a Master of Myopia with the Oculus Myopia Master. A couple of quick housekeeping items before we kick things off. You will have a text box on your GoToWebinar screen where you will be able to input questions during the webinar. Enter the questions at any time, and we'll discuss them at the end of tonight's webinar, time permitting. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Sheila Morrison. Dr. Sheila Morrison is a private practice clinician and educator. She earned her doctorate of optometry and master's degree in vision science with a focus on scleral lenses, along with a residency in cornea and contact lens from Pacific University College of Optometry. After serving on faculty at the University of Houston College of Optometry as a full-time clinical professor, Dr. Morrison joined Mission Eye Care in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, where she is the co-residency supervisor of the Mission Eye Care Residency in Cornea and Contact Lens and is also adjunct faculty at the NSU Oklahoma College of Optometry. She publishes and lectures both nationally and internationally on myopia management, contact lens, and dry eye. Her clinical research interests are currently focused on technology-driven contact lens design for orthokeratology, scleral, corneal, and custom soft contact lenses. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and the Scleral Lens Education Society. We are very excited to have Dr. Morrison with us tonight for this webinar. So without further ado, Dr. Morrison, the stage is yours. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a very nice introduction. I do have a slide uh, just to show a few disclosures, um, and you already know my bio. So um, yeah, I'm centered here in Calgary, Canada, uh, and just finished clinic. Uh, my very last few patients of the day were actually in the myopia clinic. So I'm going to share a little bit of data that we pulled from their exams today as well. Um, you know, I want to start off because we're talking about mastering skills and mastering things and with a special theme of the myopia master. Of course, this is a session that's hosted by Oculus. Um, and so I just threw this in here just as kind of an opener to kind of introduce you to kind of the goals that I have for the session, um, which are to kind of share my clinical experiences in uh, the way that we have transitioned bringing in axial length measurements into the clinic and sprinkle clinical pearls throughout the whole entire thing uh, to update everybody on a few things, hopefully that you didn't know before and maybe um, you know, I'll take away some things from our question period at the end. I'll make sure that there's time to have some conversations um, and I'm not in a rush afterwards, so I'll stay to answer as many questions as there are. Um, now, I wanted to start off with just kind of a state of affairs. I always like to kind of kind of bring things into context of kind of why do we care? We've all heard the kind of the story, you know, many times before about why myopia matters. And so I'm gonna keep this to kind of where are we at at a higher level? So we've all been aware of the World Report on Vision. And I love this report, you know, because the World Health Organization really does help us by endorsing the reality that uh, they stand behind the importance of myopia, myopia management, through position statements like this. And we can use this as ammunition when we're talking to patients and making decisions in the clinic kind of about what direction we want to go. And in particular, I wanted to highlight one of the mission, one of the things that it outlines in promoting high quality implementation and health systems research that complements existing evidence for effective eye care interventions. And what that says to me is that we're really always moving forward. And so this is kind of a, a nice trigger in 2019 by the World Health Organization to really endorse a lot of the things that we're you know, doing in the clinic and as part of honestly primary care today. Now, moving forward a little bit to 2022 as a proud Canadian, uh, I'm very proud of the Canadians. Uh, the CAO put out the first position statement following uh, the position that the World Health Organization took in 2019 that basically has shared with the universe um, things that we all kind of talk about across the world. There's no safe level of myopia. Um, and really to just highlight again the impact that in visual impairment can have on the quality of life. Um, and just, again, it's just such an important global issue. Now, again, because of what this lecture is about, what this topic is, which is pushing uh, technology forward um, and creating evidence to make great clinical decisions, again, some of the things that come out of papers like this that we can use as ammunition and tools um, are really quite powerful. So again, um, the assessment of risks is highlighted because axial length measurement, measurements um, and uh, monitoring progression. It's all about looking initially at risk and also providing education to patients and parents to mitigate that risk. So I love that they say this in this state of affairs sort of CAO position paper. Another highlight for me is, again, we're going to talk about this specifically and how we use Myopia Master axial length measurements in the clinic to also be used in appropriate follow-up 
how do we measure things to see if our treatments are working to assess efficacy and potentially adjust treatment plans. So that's 2022. Proud of the Canadian Association for putting this out because the rest of the world is, you know, pulling from things like this from our organizations that really stand behind uh, the stuff that we're kind of all excited about in the myopia clinic. Now, mainstream options, lifestyle, pharmaceutical, and optical are all out there. Some of the more novel myopia control treatments, um, you know, though we've heard a lot lately about the low-level red light therapies, contrast sensitivity spectacles are a little bit newer. I do want to just mention, you know, optical here in Canada includes spectacle options as well. I know in the States, these are kind of coming hot off the press, hopefully very soon. Um, and again, you know, we've had spectacle options for myopia control that are wonderful adjunct with you know our other therapies here for many years and so i encourage any of you that have questions for me at the end of this presentation we're going to focus more on axial length um, and kind of how that has been part of my clinic um, but you know there's a lot of things that we could talk about related to these treatments at the end if, if anybody has any specific questions about them um, and then of course low concentration atropine for premyopia would be considered kind of more of a novel therapy um, and we'll talk a little bit about that and how axial length ties into making decisions on do we treat premyopia at all? Now, moving forward to 2024, so here we are. So I wanted to present just briefly another state of affairs because this has some special, I guess, attention paid to axial length. Um, in 2024, in review of myopia management, um, a survey that was conducted by Jobson at the end of 2023 um, interviewed uh, you know, about 500 qualified respondents, so optometrists, ophthalmologists who see patients in the clinic and do practice in the US. Um, and this report is actually really cool. There's a lot of really cool things that cover all different topics in optometry, um, and especially in the myopia control arenas and contact lens. And so um, I pulled a couple of their kind of key points from this report to give you an idea of sort of where are we at in the world when it comes to measuring axial length? You know, are people doing it? So how do you usually monitor, monitor the success of different myopia management interventions is a question that they asked in their survey. And, you know, a little more um, than half perform dry refraction, which is great. Um, you know, the highlighted point here is about a quarter of uh, practitioners that were interviewed do take axial length measurements every six months. So that's encouraging. Um, you know, again, this is another way of looking at things. Do you currently measure axial length? And this, I have to say, has really gone up in the last five to 10 years. Of course, you know, 10 years ago, not many were really measuring axial length in the clinic, largely because tools to do so were just not really available. And the literature was still kind of being uncovered about the importance of it, you know, over uh, uh, refraction, et cetera. And so this is kind of cool because it shows that really things are, people are picking up on this. Um, you know, 30, about a third now um, are measuring axial length in the clinics, but that does also show us that we still have a ways to go with getting everybody up to speed. I like to kind of think of it as sort of an analogy of, you know, um, at one point in the context lens clinics, not every provider that was fitting orthokeratology, actually, in fact, very few would have had a corneal topographer. And now that tool, that technology is considered to be, if you ask many that would teach others how to fit ortho-K lenses, would say that if you had to pick, you know, an essential piece of equipment, it would be that topographer. And, you know, axial length is one of those things that, you know, as it kind of, it, the uptake continues to increase, we'll find that there are more and more ways that we can, um, you know, uh, through partners like Oculus that are creating these wonderful devices to be able to have access as well. And I want to talk a little bit about our path at the office, you know, because knowing that majority of practitioners out there are not measuring axial length yet, you know, how do you even get started and how do you find the best path for measuring axial length? And I have to say, our clinic did not, you know, I was practicing in the U.S. Um, in a setting with a lot of bells and whistles at the university, um, came back to our office here in Calgary, close to where I'm from, a beautiful clinic. My office is very, very busy. I was lucky to walk into uh, uh, an office that already had a residency trained contact lens fitter, Dr. Andrea Lasby. So I kind of joke that I wrote her coattails when I first landed into, um, you know, a situation that was busier than what I could manage from the start. And when I came, there was, we didn't have axial length tools way to measure it in the clinic. And so the way that we started in the clinic, first off, was through referring patients. So we would send our patients in the myopia clinic uh, we created a, a clinic at Mission called the Myopia Academy. And what that initiative was, was when I came back from the States and kind of had had access to some of the, you know, schools doing the research and seeing being exposed to sort of things like Treehouse Eye and all these other kind of groups about a decade ago that were doing a really kind of good job of being early adopters and getting, you know, more 
kind of a consolidated clinic going where everybody's doing the same thing. You know, we offered, you know, not just one thing, but all modalities. That's kind of what we created when I got back to Calgary. And we didn't have a tool to measure axial length at that time. So we would send everybody out. We would have a, you know, a clinic down the road, cornea specialist um, that did cataract surgery. And we would actually send our kids over um, once or twice a year for an ILL master. So that's where we started. Then we moved up along the lines into uh, uh, getting an A scan, you know, it was you know lower cost. Got it, picked it up at a trade show, um, and used that for a while until we have now um, come to the point where we're kind of upped our game all the way up the mountain uh, to those beautiful views and uh, into the myopia master. So it really, there are different ways that you can kind of get yourself there. Um, and you know, right from the very beginning, you know, we were uh, realized how important the measurements were for a variety of reasons, which I'm going to share with you kind of step by step how things looked in our clinic and where we are today with using the technology. The reality is that myopia is constantly evolving. You know, it's something that changes so rapidly that you almost have to kind of, you know, plan to have a monthly meeting in the clinic to keep on you know, teaching each other of things that are changing, concentrations of atropine, you know, standards for, you know, frequency of follow-ups for axial length, all these things, everything's always changing and getting better and better just because there's so much attention paid to it by our industry. Um, you know, globally, it's very important for us to do our best for children. And so a lot of, a lot of effort goes into research and writing and, you know, learning more about what, you know, the really, the best path really is. Now, I want to put this out to the group here tonight. Uh, this is something I took off Instagram, the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. And I want to have you just put in the chat, you know, which of these things are you the most excited for? And um, I appreciate your participation. Jacob's going to kind of take a look. And in a few minutes, he'll shout out kind of what seems to be the winner, winner, chicken dinner. Um, you know, new contact lens designs. You know, when we talk about things are always changing in the myopia arena. Certainly, there's always new things coming out the pipeline. Pharmaceutical treatments are getting really exciting because we're getting really close to the point where potentially we're going to have a compound or a commercially available pharmaceutical option, which we've never had before in North America um, for treating myopia or controlling myopia. Um, AI and data analysis is really exciting. And then, you know, you know, the environmental modifications, there's so much literature, so much study going into trying to figure out what are the right light levels, what are all the different interactions, you know, in the in the environment that we live in, what is the exact association between near work and myopic progression? So, you know, I know what I'm the most excited about. Jacob, can you see anything yet that is standing out in our chat? We or actually so what? far have um, AI and data analysis is the is the front runner. Okay, I love that. I think people probably knew that that's what we're talking about tonight. So, and I that is absolutely the thing that I'm the most excited about. And so I wanted to throw in a couple of things related to data analysis, AI that are, you know, it's not unique to myopia control. You know, there's things like this coming out all over the place every single day. You know, this study demonstrated that AI can develop more personalized cancer treatment strategies. So, you know, this is from the University of Oxford, one of, you know, bajillions of things that seem to be coming out across all health professions, really like digging into models and the power of AI, the power of data that is you know calculated and automated in some ways so that we can more quickly get uh, a lot of information put into very clear concise communication points for patients um, and so again you know here's just an example that really translates to support better clinical decision making in fields outside of myopia control across other health professions here's kind of another fun one and this is just you know going off on a little bit of a like i don't know what you want to call it this is just fun Chat GPT better than Google for cataract related patient questions. When I was looking up kind of different ways that we're using AI and using, you know, different technologies to make things quicker, to get answers and educate patients, who would have thought? I would have never thought Dr. Google would get outdone. And this article goes through, you know, how the there was an ophthalmology group, physicians that looked at comparing Google searches um, for patient instructions and how to kind of manage themselves after cataract surgery uh, versus chat GPT. And it was, chat GPT was much better. So it's kind of just kind of neat where we're headed. Um, all of the different things that we're doing and, you know, it's arguably very important to not be afraid of it, to embrace it because these tools certainly, you know, are out there and are, are there to help. Um, and learning how to leverage them and use them uh, is going to have to be the way that we move, and this is the way that we move. You'll see with not necessarily AI, but with 
you know, purely data, we've become such a long way when looking at risk for myopia progression and all the other kind of decision-making pathways become a lot more clear because of data and because of, you know, the computer-generated analysis that we can do today. Now, here's a little teaser. So my favorite of that list absolutely is the AI and data analysis. So here's a little sweetheart uh, in the clinic um, getting her very first myopia master. Um, you know, just wanted to throw this in there just to kind of show off a little bit about what the unit looks like for any of anybody out there that is interested in it but hasn't seen it yet. Um, and again, our pathway referrals out. We actually used a, as an Iowa master, then we had an A scan, and then the myopia master. And I actually did a survey um, of our first um, 75 patients that we moved from other measuring tools into um, using our new biometer. Um, and I asked them just simply, um, you know, which technology, which one do you prefer? So in A-Scan, you know, you freeze the eye and kind of lightly, we say, tickle the tears and get the little thing to beep. And I, I always thought it was super easy that there was no problem with doing that. Um, kids seem to do fine with it. All but one of that 75 patients strongly preferred using Myopia Master over our prior biometer, our prior um, tools, including the referrals out uh, to get axial length measured. And the one that did not say that it was better, just couldn't remember. So they, I don't know, I can't remember. So that's why that one, I think everybody probably, you know, and the staff agree, it's, it's easier to use than anything we've had before. Now, when it comes to how quickly things are changing, uh, Dr. Carla Zadnik, um, most of us out there know her through her reputation of being a huge contributor um, in optometry over many years. She's currently the interim dean at the College of Public Health um, at Ohio State, and she's really, you know, uh, a very strong power that be. Um, and one of the, her quotes, never stop reading. And so this next section, I wanna go through a little bit of literature, a little bit of the, you know, information from studies and some basic facts, just so that we're all talking the same language uh, and to kind of remind ourselves of some of the things that do affect how we interpret and how we use ax axial length measurements in the clinic. So I wanna just kind of touch on briefly, um, the IMI is the International Myopia Institute and it defines myopia so that when we're having communication or conversations with parents, we're all kind of talking the same language. The IMI defines myopia as uh, a half to after or more. Arguably, I'll still I'll start talking about myopia at a quarter, um, but the technical definition is this, low myopia being between a, a half to after and a six, a high being over a six, and then pre-myopia is considered a plus 75 to a minus 50. Now, another important thing from the literature that we pull um, when considering what is, you know, what is um, outside of norm is to understand what is outside of normal, we have to understand what is normal. And so just specific talking refractive error first, just so that we can have that in our minds. Um, my kind of sort of golden thing that I always try to remember, and uh, references are all listed at the bottom of all my slides, is that a six-year-old should really be about a plus 75, and it's just as simple as that. Any kid that's outside of that age norm, I'm thinking about, you know, why is that? And we're kind of on high alert for watching for progression at, for any kid or any patient that's outside of their age norm. And that's a great talking point and position where we can actually start to have early conversations with parents. Um, and I'll explain kind of the next level, the current generation of how we talk to parents using axial length and growth charts. Now, the IMI also defines different types of myopia. So it's important to understand and recognize that the studies that we're talking about in majority, and if not all, pretty much all, not all, because there's new stuff coming out all the time. And there is a lot more interest in studying adult myopia and congenital myopia and all these different variants. Um, the reality is that, you know, there are multi etiologies for myopia uh, and there are different types. And so the IMI defines pathologic versus high. One kind of important thing that we think about in the whole mission to, and the whole theme of this lecture is really looking at elongation of the eye and prevention of the eye getting longer and longer. And so, um, you know, the result of that elongation is, as we know, can lead to pathology in the back of the eye. High myopia does not mean pathologic. Progressive does not mean pathologic. Pathologic can also be low myopia and is defined by degeneration of some kind. OCT is usually the best way to kind of pull that apart. Now, congenital on the other side of the spectrum is uh, or infant versus acquired childhood school age. So again, to be really, really clear, you know, the studies that we're talking about largely when it comes to myopia management therapies are all related to, to that childhood school age myopia. 
but does not necessarily mean with certainty that the other populations on the other side, so adults and you know infant myopia, there you know could be connections and impacts on myopia control strategy, which we just don't have the data to show. And so again, all these new things coming out the pipeline, uh, really really changing things that are uh, quite exciting. Axial length basics. You know, when we're born um, uh, at birth, the eyeball length is about 16.5 millimeters. It's itty bitty tiny. We fit babies in the infant aphakia clinic here at Mission. And so those little baby eyeballs, you know, when they're aphakic, we, that's where the high, high plus comes from is those short little eyes and they grow really, really fast in their first couple years. Now, at a, uh, kind of, we'll say adulthood, but we consider like an emetropic eye average to be about 23.5 or 23.6 millimeters. And so keep that information in mind. I kind of just think of 24-ish, 23.6 between there. Um, anything over that would be kind of moving toward flags for myopia. Now, we have ways now to not only measure, but also individualize analysis um, of axial length data based on age, gender, and ethnicity. Now, that's a work in progress, and I'll show you some growth charts here shortly just to kind of uh, introduce, if not, or just, you know, remind, introduce, chit-chat about it a little bit, um, because things are uh, really, really cool with the ability to do that. It's a game changer uh, in the clinic, and I'll share why. Um, we can measure eye length, but a couple different ways. So usually A scan and biometry, of course, myopia master is biometry, and the frequency for measurements recommended is really depends on the age, the, you know, prior speed of growth, what treatments we're using, but typically across the planet, we do every three to 12 months. And I would say on average, six would be the most common. Um, but what we're seeing is, you know, more and more pract practitioners kind of measuring a little more heavily because we can accurately watch for those smaller changes at the beginning of a myopia control program, um, just to make sure that we're really doing our very best in those early stages to curb. And again, I'll teach you about a little bit more about that early stage as well. When we assess risk, uh, just to kind of summarize, so age of myopia onset is, and by the way, this is a, a figure that I kind of adapted from myopia profile, the Giffords, um, uh, they, you know, do a lot with the Brian Holden Vision Institute as Oculus is often involved with, you know, some of the things that they put out. And they put out some really wonderful resources. And this is one that I really like. It's a very concise, clear diagram that sort of helps us to assess risk. And it will, it, as you can see in my figure that I've adapted, listing kind of green being no problem, pretty chill, pretty good. And then yellow, little warning, and red being a higher risk factor. So you can read through this, but basically risk factors, early age of onset is a higher risk. So the younger they are with higher levels of myopia, and that is very intuitive that that is a risk factor. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to outdoor time being a risk factor, um, close near work being a risk factor, and then binocular vision disorders. This is one we forget about a little bit sometimes. So esophoria, high ACI ratio, accommodative leg, and intermittent exo have all been uh, linked to potentially a risk factor uh, in uh, myopic progression. And then genetics. I wanted to touch on that just a little bit to share um, because, you know, typically, both parents being highly myopic puts us at a higher risk of having a child that has high myopia or myopia themselves. I want to share today, though, a little note on genetics because you can't always rely on that. You know, and today in clinic, literally my second last patient, I just had to throw this in here quickly at the end, um, highly myopic parents. I've had sister number one in ortho cave for several years. She's a minus, was minus six. Um, this is just a little snippet or like a teaser of sort of what the software looks like, and I'll teach you about it. Um, and uh, a little small to see, but our minus six is about a 26.3, 26.1 axial length. Um, and just to give an idea of some of the things that we do in the software, this is a cool feature where we can actually enter in other risk factors. So the instrument takes a picture or takes a measurement of the length of the eye and a bunch of other measurements through the anatomy of it. And then we can actually grade their risk factors um, and put in different things that are, are related to lifestyle to create a full evaluation of what their overall risk can be. And then here's the surprise today. They brought in, she brought in her sister for the first eye exam in our clinic. Um, this is sister number two. Remember, both parents are highly myopic, like highly, like 12 and like five or something like that. And sister is like over a six, has been in myopia control for several years, kind of holding steady there. And this sister with all these genetics is a plus a quarter, plus 75 with a 23 millimeter eyeball. So the lesson here is that, and it goes the other way too, 
you know, when we consider treating premyopia and consider, you know, what is the genetic, you know, on average, two myopic parents equals most of the time a myopic kid, but not always. That's where data collection and looking at risk factors like eye length and really watching patients as they grow um, is, is really important to put all the pieces together rather than just assume. Now back to assessing risk, and what about axial length? That's a risk factor. We know a longer eyeball is at a higher risk, um, and so we look at the absolute number when it comes to axial length and also the rate of change. Now, longer eyes have a greater lifelong risk of myopia-associated pathologies, and the risk of pathology associated with myopia increases with every day after. So that, what that take-home means is that every day after matters. There's a paper by Mark Bullimore and Noel Brennan um, back in 2019 that really shows that there is really no time that's too late to intervene because even if we catch a kid or a patient that's already kind of somewhere along the myopic journey, every day after does count. And as we hit closer to 26 millimeter eye, or over a minus four, that's where things really take off. It's not linear, it'll take off suddenly and so, um, or increase in this in the speed in which the um, correlation or the association with pathology just goes up more and more sharply. Now, risk is also something that's, when we look at assessing risk, this is a really kind of an important study to not forget. And I have to admit, you know, up until earlier this year, um, one of my favorite um, co-workers, work, work wives, Dr. Leah Capilani reminded me that at Academy last year, we actually had this little study in our, in our uh, presentation. And back in 2007, um, Don Muddy and his group had put out a paper that has already shown that the fastest rate of change in refractive error, axial length, and uh, peripheral refractive year actually occurs the year before onset. And that's where now, as we have these tools to actually measure axial length, you know, it opens the question, should we be measuring axial length early on kids before the myopic? And the answer to that in our clinic is definitely a yes, um, because that fast acceleration can be a signal to us so that we know that what is coming with more certainty. Now, here's a little kind of summary that I wanted to include, because whenever we think about, okay, we're talking axial length, we know we got to measure it. It's a huge, important thing in the clinic. All the studies that come out are using it as a primary kind of gold standard for is the treatment effective or not. Um, and so the question we get a lot in the clinic, or what I get when I'm lecturing or from other providers is, do we still even need to be measuring refractive error? Or on the flip side, I mean, can't we just measure refractive error and call it a day because they are somewhat correlated? And the answer is, as far as a baseline, I mean, you really can't necessarily just say this patient has a this length of eye, I know their prescription because you just don't. The prescription comes from the system as a whole. And so a patient with a four, a minus, let's just say the you know, two different patients, one with a minus four could have a shorter eyeball than another one. And the one with the longer eye minus four, let's just say even at a younger age, would potentially be at a higher risk. So these are two different things. Um, and that being said, axial length does appear to be the stronger risk factor then refraction for future myopia associated vision impairment. Meaning again, you know, the longer that eyeball gets with a similar refractive error, the more at risk that that patient would be. And we always need to be, and this was a, something that was put out in myopia profile a couple years ago by Kate Gifford, just a summary, um, just I wanted to include it just for some clinical tips. We still always need refraction and I'll go through our clinic kind of pathway, but would consider a cycloplegic refraction in the beginning. And if you're not measuring axial length regularly, then you may want to cyclo repeatedly over time to make sure that we're not getting tricked by the little kids accommodative system. Now, another clinical pearl I wanted to share is that remember that it is not typical, and this is out of this summary um, that Dr. Gifford, the Giffords put out into this article. Remember when we're looking at kids in myopia and watching for myopic progression um, by looking at axial length or refractive error, changes to corneal astigmatism are not typical. If we see changes to corneal cell, we're already kind of thinking, why is that happening? Do we need to think about a referral for, you know, uh, to get the cornea, the back surface of the cornea image with their pentacam um, to make sure that we rule out the risk of keratoconus? And then finally, as a nice lead into the rest of this presentation or this central chunk is, um, Dr. Gifford talked a little bit about in this article about growth charts have being published and are being kind of further and further developed. And that's where Myopia Master has pulled in nicely, you know, the ability to use some of these growth charts. Now, growth charts are really fun to use and really effective because I'm a parent, you know, we don't really think about absolute refractive error anymore and when we're talking to parents and, and patients um, to really kind of get the story across. 
and nor is it really the primary in the literature anymore either. What we tend to pull to is, is percentiles. Where do these children land on percentile charts related to axial length and refractive error um, according to age and ethnicity? Um, parents understand growth charts. You know, I, you know, whereas my kid is in the 80th percentile for height, oh wow, very, very tall, or you know, a little underweight. So we can really communicate well by using these growth charts. And one big take home when understanding and interpreting how axial length um, changes is that the growth rates of the eye change with age. And not only that, even a really important point when looking at axial length changes or any treatment in the myopia clinic is that we are not, our goal is not to stop or reverse, just to be very, very clear. Our goal is to put our growth rate more on a normative curve. So we need to understand what normative is. We're not going to want, we don't want to stop our kids from growing at a normal rate. Although in the clinic with myopia treatments, I do sometimes see um, that, you know, kids will really hold steady with under normative growth for many, many growth cycles. And that's something that I think is quite common with myopia control therapies. And there's all the other growth periods where they do grow and they're going to change just as much as in a successful system, you know, as much as a child who's emetropic would be growing at a certain rate. Here's an example of uh, growth charts. And to date, we really um, are still developing growth charts. There are there's literature that has looked at kind of two different, we'll say, populations, and we sort of, at this point, it's kind of sad but true that we're still kind of stuck with either Caucasian or, we'll say, Asian, although we all know that that really is not super um, easy, especially for staff to really sort through. And so we're continually updating the evidence, and globally, there are studies being done as we speak looking at further modifying demographics, locations. Um, but for now, a lot of the stuff that we pull from in the recent years um, are based on growth charts like this. So this shows, um, you can see that the growth is not linear. And so the quickest rate is right off at the beginning at the initiation or the start of myopia. Um, and then that growth can be somewhat altered depending on the age. And usually it sort of slows down as kids get, old, get older naturally. Here's an example of the Asian growth chart. So again, very different numbers, but we're looking at percentiles, we're looking at axial length, um, and uh, these are, you know, really, really helpful for use in the clinic. Now, we used to at Mission pull these growth charts and literally look at them by hand. So we would actually had an Excel sheet at one point that we had created in the clinic where we would manually enter in axial length and had this big algorithm that we had programmed in um, based off of the Brian Holden Vision Institute a long, long time ago. And very cumbersome, very kind of like tedious, not super professional looking, honestly. Um, but that's what we did. And we would go back and look at their numbers and kind of mark them on according to where they should be for their age. And parents understand that. Now, when it comes to how do we discuss normal, I want to show you that there is a difference. And you can see if you really look, pay attention to the numbers in these growth charts, there is a difference, we'll say, between our Asian or non-Asian eye. And on average, the elongation does decrease about 15% per year. Um, but this figure is really, really important as to kind of give some general sort of uh, pieces of information when looking at what is success in the clinic. We know that a myope who is a myopic patient without myopia control therapies on average at seven years old, um, and this is based on literature, um, peer review, all the nine yards, is on the in the Asian eye about a point five, two millimeter growth per year at seven years old, and the non-Asian being about 0.35. So that's a big difference. So think about that in the clinic when you think about what is, and this is not normal, this is myopic progression. Normative would be less than that. And so we'll talk about what would be considered successful in a second. At 12 years old, it levels out a lot more. So in an Asian eye, about a 0.2 to a 0.3 would be the average rate of a myopic progression um, at that age that's a little bit older, and a 0.2 in non-Asian. Now, I wanted to put this beside it, which again is pulled from the myopia profile, and basically what it's echoing is that there are different sort of amounts of uh, elongation of the eye that are considered to be normative, and on average, compared to the 0.5 or a 0.3 at a seven-year-old who's not getting myopia control therapies, an acceptable in the green for that same age population is around a 0.1 to a 0.2. So when you have kids in the clinic who are younger and you're still, you're doing, you know, all the myopia control therapy and they're progressing based on axial length by a 0.1 or 0.2 per year, 
that's actually really good. That's actually very successful. And moderate success, 0.2 to 0.3 at that age. So it's kind of one of those things that taking it within a grain of salt, we used to be very hard on ourselves when there was any amount of progression, no more. Now, if we move up the age group, it's again, a little bit less is acceptable. So by 12 or older, um, to keep things on a normative rate, we want to be definitely under a 0.2 per year. And that's considered successful. So think about that when we're looking at you know, how do we explain to a parent? Because parents, when you take the measurement, they see any amount of change, they're gonna write down those numbers and compare them and say, what the heck? Why is my kid progressing? And this is the kind of where the myopia master will actually pull data like this to be able to plot and show, okay, there's a bit of change, but that change is actually on a normative rate. Now, back to the notion that treatment efficacy is not linear, this is a kind of an important point to kind of highlight is the care, the idea of care, which is cumulative absolute reduction axial elongation. This is a paper that came out in the early, in 2021-ish, um, and it was suggested that, again, that axial length is the, um, the preferred endpoint, so we all kind of accepted that now. At the initial rate of reduction, being really fast in the beginning. So just as we mentioned in those prior literature sort of explanations of what normal is, where at the onset, first of all, a year or two before the onset of myopia, we have the fastest rate of change in axial length. Then at the onset, we still have a very fast rate. And the initial rate of slowing, which we'll sometimes see to be very dramatic in that first year of treatment, it's not always sustainable. So we hit it really hard in the beginning is the message. And then it will continue to kind of go on to that normative curve. And it's not always going to be at the same rate. So that's why success is not one year. Success is not two years. Success is cumulative over many years. Um, and so again, just to kind of keep that in perspective, again, when we average, there are gonna be growth periods where kids are gonna grow more than other growth periods. And that's completely normal. So I want to move into just a quick case presentation uh, to share with you kind of some of the ways that we would use axial length in the beginning, um, largely before we had myopia master and also to kind of just have a couple bit of fun with some cases. So here's a kid who was referred in um, in 2020, so had a prescription that was given to them at six years old for about a diopter and a quarter. And basically what they said um, was that the family was not really happy with that diagnosis. They wanted a second opinion, came to our office, no visual complaints. Mother and father are, um, father's high myope, mother is low. And so we saw them in our clinic for a myopia workup. And the way that that looks in our clinic, first and foremost in the clinic, we do a full primary care exam first. And then what we do is we go ahead and bring them back for a second visit and we do a full evaluation including all this stuff so we bring them for a, a workup this is a sample kind of to show sort of what we do dry refraction wet auto refraction and a cyclo refraction so um that means that we'll use cyclopentylate we do that on every baseline for our kids in the myopia clinic and um, then we measure of course axial length corneal topography and do bv testing prior to dilation now, results in this case were, you know, not necessarily uncommon. It happens not infrequently where, you know, we will have a child or a patient that even in our own clinic, we think they're minus and we get all excited, get pumped on it, and we cycle them and they're actually still a bit of plus. So at the bottom, this little one, 23.4, 23.2 millimeter eyeball, uh, about plus a quarter and a plus a half. So at this point in 2020, and would I do things differently now? Maybe, um, you know, but at this point in 2020, weren't really doing much for pre-myopia, said, okay, you know what, we'll see you back, um, and at this time, see you back in a year. So that may have been the number one mistake, because here they come back in 2021, as scheduled, as recommended, one year later, and they've jumped up big time. So we just missed the boat on this one. So we went from a six-year-old, now we're about seven, and um, our, you know, now the kid is actually complaining about blurry vision to see the board at school. Active lifestyle, parents of course haven't changed. Um, and so just to kind of kind of put it in your minds here, what do we choose? So this is, a, we'll say a cyclo refraction, minus 150, ask yourself, what are you gonna put them in? Um, and so what we did in this case, there, the patient is actually would have been a very good candidate for all therapies. Corneal topography, normal, refractive error, getting close to that minus two-ish, which would be totally fine for ortho-K. Great spherical candidate, so a daily soft lens is, you know, potentially an on-label option. 
very safe option on the market for contact lens and that's what we went with so we just threw them into my site in this case um, and away we went so I want to share with you now kind of the results um, if you kind of take a look down this there is not really a whole lot of change over a couple of years I would say this is a little bit better than average for most kids because they're going to grow normally a little bit um, but in this case in that first period of intervention really held true to what the studies show is that that initial Kind of curbing of that fast growth is usually really significant in the first year or two and that's certainly what we saw for this patient and you know again a uh, lesson for everybody every single patient in our clinic that has contacts has to have glasses as a backup so we in, we advise them they got their glasses minus 150 single vision no complications with lens wear awesome everything's great i want to put out here too that this is a missed opportunity and this is coming down the pipeline for you in the united states or those that are in canada listening too in that we put this kid in single vision, but in reality, with soft lenses, every time that we have a patient wearing a myopia control device in their contact lens, you know, there's always going to be periods of time where they're not wearing their contacts, you know, 70% of the time. In fact, sometimes it, we recommend that they take breaks on weekends. And so as far as having an opportunity for higher level of care, building your practice with um, products that they are going to be coming back to you for, um, in terms of like, you know, for example, my control spectacle, this was a missed opportunity. So our future selves or our, if I was to redo it, I would have intervened a little earlier, probably would have had them back at six months when I saw that they're outside of their age norm at six years old, plus a quarter plus a half is not a plus 75. And we would have caught that just a little sooner. And then if we put them in contacts, again, the lesson would be also, you know, consider partnering with those myopia control spectacles that are coming to market in the States and that we've had for a very long time in Canada. A note on follow-up schedules, you know, this is just kind of a fun little summary again to like how often should we be seeing our kids. Um, this is just a summary that is recommended by, again, the IMI, summarized by myopia profile, looking at when do we see kids back. It's really easy to just prescribe atropine and say, see you in a year. The reality is when I get kids back in the clinic, you know, we may actually see side effects and when we're not expecting it. Contact lenses can have complications. And so it's a missed opportunity if we, you know, finalize a lens in the first day of them wearing them and then don't see them back for three to six months, we can miss a complication. And furthermore, when it comes to appropriate follow-up, which is one of the mandates in the Canadian paper that really clearly defines and says, you know, not only do we need to assess risk, mitigate risk, we have to also you know, follow patients in a frequency that's appropriate to be able to make changes to treatments, we do need to see kids back a little more frequently in the beginning of a myopia control treatment than maybe what we once did like every six months. So that leaves us to where are we today. So as you can see, this is very cumbersome. So we made these lists, we have all these axial length measurements, we're kind of every time the kid comes in, we're explaining to the parents, oh yeah, they stayed the same, they're different, they're better, whatever. And so I wanna share with you now, where are we now? And I wanted to show kind of to introduce the software just a little bit. Um, and this is a case presentation of one of Andrea's patients, Dr. Lasby here at the clinic. Just another kind of fun example of what the software looks like. Um, this was a kid in 2022, Plano, again, different provider, not one of our myopia providers. Now everybody's doing the same thing. At six years old, this was a missed opportunity where they were Plano and then actually were lost to follow up. We did ask them to come back in six months, but they didn't do it. And then they came back finally two years later when the vision was starting to get blurry looking at the board. And this is an example of a kind of where the, the, the data tells more than what you would realize at times. So an eight year old prescription this year is about a minus one and a minus 75 with a little bit of sill. Axial length 24 and 20, about 24 OU. Smaller, younger child, little higher prescription. Um, now, this is what the data looks like when we plug it in and it gives a nice projection, so axial length is measured. And what we use this for is to really start to kind of understand, is this like a longer eyeball or a shorter eyeball with, you know, what are those risk levels? Here's the other sibling, and it's actually the 10-year-old, not the 8-year-old. And in this case, we actually ended up seeing with the axial length, a lower prescription this year. So went from a plus 50 to a minus a quarter, so just to recap. Our younger kid, higher prescription, 24 millimeters, about a minus one. Older kid, minus a quarter, minus 75, with a bit more sill, and the axial length is already longer. So we are at about a 25.3. So the purpose of sharing these measurements with you is to be able to show how we can pull the axial length data to make better clinical decisions based on risk, because Sometimes we'll have a higher prescription with a longer eyeball and vice versa. 
And the shorter eye, we're not necessarily going to be jumping the gun with higher concentrations of atropine right off the hop. We may be a little bit more patient versus eyes that have more risk factors. We would maybe think about following them a little bit more closely. Now, this is just an intro kind of some, like picture of what the software kind of looks like and what we were kind of had initially. And I've been lucky enough at the clinic to have access to the latest and the greatest. And I want to share that because it's really, really cool. So the latest and greatest with my OP Master is called the new growth control module. And what it has in it is in addition to showing kind of plotting um, axial length on a chart based on demographic and age, the new module can actually convert the data into easier to understand projections that shows the growth rate. So not just kind of where do they land on this graph, um, but where are they in their actual growth rate per year? And I'll show you, they use a color-coded scale. It's really cool, green being normal, orange being moderate, red being that we need to do make a change. So this is a, fig this is a video that I wanted to share that I made um, utilizing the software just to highlight kind of the new module. Now, this is a patient um, in the clinic that, or this is a patient case, an example case. Patient is a little older, 17 years old. Um, the treatment is atropine, ethnicity Caucasian. So the way that we pull this, the data is listed with the oldest on the bottom, newest on the top. So you double click on the top to open up and kind of see that we've got both eyes measured and then it'll pull the software open as you can see here and pulls us to our kind of former kind of typical screen, the one that you would have seen on my last uh, screen that shows axial length. So in this particular case, the kid is about a, or the, I guess, young adult, 17 years old, is 26.2, 26.67, gives us other information. And as we move over to the right, it shows us kind of where they land. And believe it or not, in that little space, those are three different data points. It's actually really hard to read and interpret. So the new module shows us this growth kind of curve, and it's a growth control measure that shows in a much easier way exactly what treatment is used and exactly what the rate of change is. Now the module also has always had this ability to print off this report for parents too. We personalize it for the office and so what we do is we have our logo on it and it can pull these charts and show kind of where the patient has been through the measurements, where do they land compared to normative data, and also give a little bit of information just about myopia in general. So these are beautiful graphics. It's kind of cool to have and it saves us time. Um, all this time spent explaining stuff to people, we can now print off and just kind of give them this one and done report card where we used to literally put it into a spreadsheet and create a, a you know Excel graph and try to print it off that way. Here's another example, a different case. This is a kid in ortho -K, um, a 13 year old. And again, we'll just kind of skip straight ahead on this one to go right into the measurements because you're familiar with where things are. And so same sort of idea, double click the newest one, it will open the software. And just to give another demo and example of exactly uh, what I mean, here is our axial length 25.1 and 25.97. And, you know, it's a really kind of narrow amount of space where we have multiple data points. By the way, the colored bar shows the treatment. So that's selected to be ortho -K, which is really cool. Gives us a really quick visual of what treatment we're using and what the effect of the treatment has been. Now to kind of expand that, here we have in the last screen where it almost looked like it was nice and stable. This really tells a much better story because the growth rate you can see on the left and right is actually a 0.28 on the left and a 0.37 on the right, which based on my earlier explanations is actually not really as good as what we would have thought. In fact, that tells me that we probably need to make a change to this treatment because we're not really for this age falling under that kind of golden should be a 0.1 or 0.2 max change per year. And when we go back and look here, we can then say, well, we've got to make a change. I'm going to add another treatment so we can add that in at our, at our um, appointment, say add atropine in this case. And then moving forward, we're going to have the rate of change very clearly pictured for communication and your records with the bar that shows exactly what treatments, whether it's just the one, you've changed it, it's combination, and it's just a lot easier to read, um, measure, and kind of communicate everything all at once. Now, in terms of clinical integration, the software we use in the clinic, we use it as an education point. Our doctors is a Dr. O'Brien. Um, we literally will sit with an eye model and point and show exactly what we're looking at when we're explaining to patients. Here's another screen. This is how we would kind of demonstrate to a patient 
um, you know, using the, the software. It's a really valuable tool that patients are very impressed with. So when we think about, you know, what do we need to do to create a, a practice that has value, that patients understand why they're paying fees. You know, we want to have things in the clinic like, you know, tools like this and software that shows value that we, there's a reason that there's a service fee or there's a reason that we have expertise, you know, compared to our neighbor down the street. And so these tools are really, have been a great teaching point um, for all of our doctors to really pull from uh, to show these wonderful graphics to our patients. And we really love it for them. Now, this is a, a case courtesy of Dr. Chulo, Dr. Bill, who's a wonderful, probably a lot of you have seen his webinars and a lot of the stuff that he does, um, huge contributor over many years. And I wanted to share um, some of the features and pictures to show some of the other things that the software can do. And what you're looking at is actually an annual growth rate of an eye. And you can see on the left, this is prior to my myopia control therapy, and it'll average about like on the left a 0.5, right a 0.5 annual axial growth rate of the eye per year. And again, from our normative data, we know that's just not acceptable. Put them on myopia control therapies, and you can see in this case, very powerful graphic where on the left eye, actually both the left and right, we've really normalized that growth to a 0.08. So that's a huge, huge improvement, um, really slowing the growth very quickly. Now this is another patient. So here's kind of a fun case again, just looking at that spread that I talked about a little bit where it can be a little bit hard to interpret and read when we look at the treatments. And again, those bars that you see in the software will be corresponding to whatever treatment it is that you identify to be blue. So maybe that's your ortho cave, whatever you wanna put it in the clinic. And then as we spread that out, you can really see. So here we have two different ortho cave treatments and it's kind of hard to see what's going on. But when we pull it open, you can see that ortho -K blue is a standard ortho -K lens. So that would be a larger kind of um, treatment zone in the middle, maybe a 6.0 or a 6.5 or something like that. And after you know some period of time, they were able to measure and see that that growth rate is still 0.2 or 0.25 during that period, which is actually outside of what we want. Time to make a change in the purple at that time point, move the kid into an ortho -K designed for myopia with a smaller treatment zone. And you can see if the treatment is effective or not. And in this case, it, it was. So really powerful data, really cool outputs, um, brand new software, and it's been really you know, a pleasure and a lot of fun to kind of play around with in the clinic. Now, in our clinic, again, in summary, how does it affect my treatments? How does it affect my decision-making? How does it affect the clinic in a positive or negative way? You know, education adds value to the staff or to the practice. Um, you know, we know axial length elongation is the primary concern in the clinic as far as are one of the biggest concerns. So actually physically being able to measure that differentiation between normal and abnormal growth and then of course creating a systematic and very personalized approach as you can see from the software it is very personalized um, and again that's very specific to the software so there are there are biometers and different tools that we have personally used um, to measure these things and kind of explore and the reality is that the, the software is the difference and that's what's been the the big difference for us in moving we'll say up in the world into the myopia master now, I want to just briefly touch on the core aid and um, allow time for questions just because I think it's important to kind of keep this in the in the topic because there's a lot of attention being paid to choroidal thickness these days. And the reality is that optical biometry is capable of measuring, however, you know, the thickness of the cornea or if there's corneal changes or different things that we're measuring through ortho -K would adjust would affect the optical biometry ability to measure the choroid thickness. So typically in the clinic, we still would measure the choroid um, using OCT. But it's gained a lot of attention um, in that there is strong evidence to suggest that the human cord is sensitive to different physiologic, optical, and pharmacologic factors. Um, and it does, these things, these factors modulate its thickness. And so it's kind of an interesting new thing that has uh, become uh, an area of interest in the literature and in the research and some of those questions, you know, what is the exact role of the choroid? We know that atropine is thought to thicken the layer in the eye called the choroid. Um, you know, why is that? And is it long-term or short-term? That's a big question. You know, are the associations, uh, are there associations with a thicker choroid and a shorter eye, et cetera? I want to share a quick case example. So we started measuring this in the clinic just kind of for fun with the, we would do axial, we do now axial length with myopia master on every patient um, and then choroidal thickness as well. And here's a minus 275, we're on a 24 millimeter eye. So that's a really interesting finding, isn't it? Normally we'd think minus is going to be, you know, a lot higher than that, like well above 24 millimeters. But again, a perfect reason why we need to use measurement to get the answer, not assume things about the risk, because 
this patient would be at a lower risk than a patient with a minus 275 with an eyeball that's already 24.5 or higher with their axial length. Um, now, the thickness of the choroid in this case uh, is about 250, we'll say. 250, so remember, minus 275, shorter eyeball, nice thick choroid, and this patient just for fun is in ortho -K. Here's another one uh, that we took at 675, so a lot higher prescription, really long eyeball, so 27.8, and again, makes sense. If it's stretched out, the choroid would be thinner, and the choroidal measurements on OCT are 124 and 166. So just kind of cool things to include in, in conversations like this. And another thing that we really do care about a lot, that we're learning about a lot, is that low light, uh, the low red light therapy. And so the only thing I'm going to say about this is because we're coming to the end, so we have time for questions, um, is that there are there's a lot of stuff that has been you know put out in the last we'll say a couple years that has drawn attention to the repeated low light low red light therapy, um, and ha it has been shown to significantly reduce myopia progression in some studies. Um, some groups really you know don't put a lot of light on the eye for a big effect. There's definitely something there with red light. However, on the flip side, just to be um, you know, known, we don't really understand the full effect on the choroid. Is it causing it to swell because it's getting inflamed? In some cases, there were kids that did have um, a little bit of hypoautofluorescence and um, perhaps uh, retinal damage maybe that may or may not be reversible. And so um, choroid is a really important kind of thing that we're looking at a little bit more closely when it comes to atropine and these light therapies and also, I mean, even ortho -K, there are changes. And so um, things to kind of think about that are out there that um, are always changing. So always keep reading. Now in closing, um, a couple of big picture considerations just to kind of tie in things that I love to talk about that are um, in addition to the journey with the Myopia Master that the way that we've used it in the clinic. I just wanna provide a final few clinical things for everybody, um, big picture beyond the actual measurements. So, you know, there's a lot of things that we think about, but kind of the four key parameters for success in myopia management really include quality of vision, quality of life, safety and compliance. And these are factors that are important, you know, to really, um, make sure not to neglect. We can get really caught up sometimes in just looking at data and just looking at, but the reality is we need it all. It's all part of doing our very best for our patients and providing the highest quality outcomes. And another kind of side note in the end that I want to just kind of remember is that treatments are long-term commitments. And so remember that these often when we put a kid in a myopia program and start measuring that axial length, bring them in for their myopia master, it's a long-term thing. It's not, it can be complicated. It can be a little bit expensive at times. And so we really want to consider the risk and the benefit. And again, really that ties in the whole importance of collecting data and risk factors, including axial length, to really decide what is that actual risk? What is actually happening? You know, are we really getting a good relaxed refraction? Is the eye actually changing in length or is it something that we need to kind of spend a little time watching before we jump right in? Um, you know, I'm all for do a lot of pre-myopia management today, but we also really kind of take a careful look at axial length to look at what that bottom line risk is to when we make those decisions. In closing, um, I just want to highlight that early intervention is best. So remember assessment before the onset of myopia, including with Myopia Master, has been a huge important part of our practice to kind of get the conversation going and make sure we're doing our very best for kids and families. Appropriate follow-up is required to adjust treatment. So when something is not working, we're getting that growth of the eye that falls outside of a normative that would be considered normative, we need to have that measurement to say, hey, you know, we need to make a change. And using software is one way to be able to do that very, very quickly, very effectively, and communicate it very clearly. And really, the evolution of our best practice does require constant updating and evidence-based education. So, you know, those tools that we have are all at our fingerprints to elevate your practices. Um, and just in closing, Myopia Master has really been a rocks. It really does. Um, no one asked me to say that. It just is the way that it is. We love it. I don't know if we could go back. Um, and so uh, in closing, I want to thank you for attending. Um, and I would love to take any questions if there are, uh, are any that need to be answered. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Morrison. That was really fantastic. I think the depth and the breadth of the information there and the clinical pearls, in addition to, for me personally, just the emphasis on the early intervention is huge. So you highlighting that is, is really fantastic. And we do have a few wow. questions here um, sure. asked by the audience. So we're actually going to start broad here with this first one. Um, and this actually was alluded to a bit in your last slide, which is, in a situation where you know a parent might be a bit hesitant to pursue myopia management for certain factors, let's say costs, for example, how do you approach a situation along those lines? So the way that we approach it truly is it's not really an option anymore, honestly. So we kind of 
first of all, we do a pretty good job of um, identifying, and, and let's just say, I'm gonna actually jump right into, there's two scenarios. So one, we have no control over. We have a patient that we have never touched in the past. It's their very first time and they're having a hard time. The one, say you you know get that new patient and they're not really 100% sure, they've never heard about it before. They learn that there's a cost associated with it and that's not something they've ever been used to and they're kind of unsure. Just remember that just because they're uncertain today does not mean they'll be uncertain tomorrow. So a failure today where they're unsure is not a failure forever. It is an opportunity to put in your two cents and get them kind of, you know, get their feet wet. And what you always want to do in those cases where you have somebody that's giving you a little pushback and you're just unsure, they don't quite, you know, take the, they're not ready. Um, you want to make sure you book them back sooner than later to get that next data point. So often I'll say, no problem, let's get you back for a quick check in six months. And if your spidey senses are correct because you recommended it in the first place for a reason, they probably have been a procrast and writings on the wall. And so by then they'll have had resources you've given them and have time to kind of dig in a little bit more to learn. Now, the way that we, the way that I approach it in, in general, um, that really has kind of done away with a lot of the pushback, we don't get a lot of pushback anymore because it's essentially part of primary care. We don't really offer it as much of an option. It's more, and it's not pushy. It's, it's like, hey, this is what's happening. Which theory, like which direction do we want to go with this? You know, are you more comfortable coming back for me to check again in six months? You know, we'll talk to patients about the reality is that 100% of the schools of optometry teach this to new doctors and, you know, our World Health Organization endorses it and we have all of these powers that be and it's really something that is our responsibility and it's no longer really an option. That'd be like having somebody with major high blood pressure and you just don't say anything and let them go. And so parents, I think, if they are primed when it's appropriate, so in pre-myopia or parents that are myopic, any chance you get to have something up in the clinic to prime and, and sort of like make sure you're set up for it, that helps. And then kind of approaching it, you're not, not forceful, we don't want to scare them, but really explain why and just, it's not really an option you say, hey, look, this is the standard for this condition. We know that it's going to progress. Luckily, our generation sadly missed the boat, but kids today, the standard is to provide options that will slow or halt progression. This is how we do it. Here's how that works in our clinic. You know, at what point would this be something that would work for you? Wonderful, thank you. And I love the analogy of the blood pressure as well. I think that's a that's a really fantastic way to look at it, just in terms of it being a biomarker and keeping an eye on yeah. things over time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we'll try to squeeze one more question here. And thankfully, we actually have two that are that are phrased pretty similarly. So I'm going to try to to join these together. And that's in terms of axial length growth rate and the amount of axial length change at what point are you starting to investigate a dual therapy type situation? I think you alluded to this a bit again when you were speaking about the nonlinearity of efficacy with certain treatments, um, but what is the amount of change when you start to investigate that dual therapy initiation? So it's all, there's no black and white for me, and I'll just do this quickly just in case there's time for anything else, um, and I will stay if there's anybody that needs anything at the end. Um, the, there's no black and white. I think it is very dependent on prior history of rate of change. Do they just have a massive height change? Do they have, what is the length of their eye? Are they well under 25 still and they hit a growth spurt? You know, are there, there's just so many factors that go into deciding if we're going to do combination therapy because the reality is that combination therapy where I do use it, I will pull it, you know, over and over for kids that are 26 and higher right off the bat almost, or if we're wanting to add adjunct when something is just not working horizontal. So say we make a change in the ortho -K lens to change that optic and it's not effective. We move them into a different style, a daily, daily wear contact or something like that. I'll add adjunct or they're doing just atropine and it's not quite effective enough. I'll add, as soon as they're ready, we'll add the optical therapy too. But it's really based on multi-factors. Um, I would say definitely I'd be a little bit worried. Um, anything that's in the red or, or the orange or the or the red in the myopia master, where on average for like a seven to 10 year old, I'm gonna off the top of my head, I'm gonna say like on average, regardless of demographic, would be a 0.3 or more, I'm really thinking about it. And I may then invite them back in three months to see if that change is actually still progressing or if it's just kind of a one-off. If they have low risk factors and they've been stable for a long time, I might not jump to it. If writing's on the wall, parents are high, siblings have myopia, they've been changing steadily, we'll just put, it, put them on it. Um, depending on those risk factors. 
Wonderful, thank you. So yeah, we do have one other one here that we can um, toss over your direction, and that's when it comes to differentiating myopia progression, um, be it due to axial length as opposed to excessive close work, reading, phone use, and that sort of thing. Is that something that you think about, and what is your thought process kind of pertaining to differentiation? Um, in so that realm? is the question, I'm still not sure on the question. <laughs> so is it like, how do I differentiate what is more important and what I put more attention to? Yeah, I would say maybe take it whichever angle you think is, is best, but I think that that's a great way to approach it. Sure, yeah, so um, I would say it's all important. I, the axial length is probably, when I look at risk, my number, my the my most important, more so than near work and time outdoors, although it's, you know, you can't really avoid near work these days. It's not something that almost every kid is at high risk because of their near work. Um, it depends on where you're living, the outdoor time, that's a whole nother lifestyle thing. Probably the most important, like the ones that I look at the most would be genetic. Um, age of onset of myopia is huge. Um, and then the absolute number to start of axial length and then what is the growth rate? So um, the baseline is really important to get good clean data. And then from there, if you have that baseline with the axial length and the refractive error there, you can kind of correlate the two a little bit more, but that early risk analysis is really important to look at all three of those things. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. That just about concludes the time we have for this evening. Um, thank you again, Dr. Morrison. That was really fantastic and for being with us this evening. Um, thank you all for, for attending and for sending in the questions. Um, on behalf of Oculus, I hope everyone has a fantastic rest of their evening. And just as a reminder, we do have this recorded, so that will be available um, sometime after the presentation. So thank you again, Dr. Morrison. Um, thank it was you a pleasure. for having me. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And I hope you have uh, all have a great rest of your evening. Thanks.